All right, I think we are live. How are you doing, everyone? And welcome to the Dividend Power Hour. My name is Mark Rusin. If this is your first time joining, welcome. But let me know if you guys can hear me. I am uh, traveling in New Orleans for a um, financial content creator conference right now. So if you are out there in the audience, just give me a, a thumbs up that you can hear me right now. So let's see who is in there in the house right now. Can you hear me? We got a, a lot of great updates. We're going to go through some earnings updates today. We're going to go through some economic uh, activity updates today. We're going to go through the Federal Reserve, everything that's going on um, in, in the markets right now. I know the markets are starting to get a little bit choppy right now. So we're going to try and cover that to see which direction are the, is the stock market going to go here moving forward. So I see the J is in the house. Jay, can you hear me? All right. Just want to make sure everything is set up all right here in my room. Again, I am in. Um, New Orleans right now. So I see we're, we're a lot. A lot of people are coming in right now. We're up to uh, thirty folks right now coming into the dividend power hour. Um, awesome. So you guys, you guys can hear me. So let's, without further ado, start jumping in to our slide deck here. So if, if this is your first time, this is the slide deck we go through each and every week, covering the status and just an overall arcing of what's going on in the stock market. So right now, the Dow Jones year-to-date is up 1.5%. Um, we got the S&P 500 up 12.4%, and the NASDAQ is up 27.2%. No real change between the order of performance there, but the real change, though, is if you look at the last five trading days, all red for each and every single uh, index that we have there. Dow Jones is down 0.4%, actually the best performing over the past five days. The S&P 500 is down almost a percent and a half and NASDAQ down two and a half percent over the past five days. Again, today was a rough trading day as the Dow Jones was down over 300 points. We got some some unrest going on over in the Middle East. Um, we have also Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This has spiked oil prices. We actually dipped down into the low uh, 82 range and now we're back up over 88 and progressing towards $90 again. I truly believe that we could see oil prices well above uh, $100 a barrel here sooner rather than later. Uh, in terms of valuation, analysts are still looking for 2024 EPS of about 247. That is a per share basis on the to totality of the S&P 500. That puts the S&P 500 trading at a price to earnings multiple of 17.5 times, one tick down from where we were last week. And as we know, there's a 10-year forward average of about 17.4. So kind of fairly valued, slightly overvalued, if you want to call it that. Um, in terms of what's going on here. So, and then interest rates. Interest rates is really what's been weighing on the stock market, especially in the past week alone. Look at these interest rates. I put last week's um, stats there. You can see the 10 year was at 4.7, it's now at 4.9%. We have a two year that was at 5.08%. We're now looking at 5.21%. Let me kind of go over here and kind of just show you what we are talking about in terms of just where rates have gone. Look at the two-year here. If we go here, the two-year, just in, in, in the past five days alone, you could see below 5% we go, and then we just start skyrocketing, putting more and more pressure um, on higher rates, put pressure on equity yields. Let's look at the 10-year. Same thing. You could see we had a dip early in the past five days down to 4.559, we can call it, and then pretty much straight up from there, well over 4.9%. So a lot of pressure there. Um, in terms of stocks. So let's go back. And I, I see a bunch of you starting to jump in here for the dividend power. Hour. And th again, this is new. We usually do the dividend power on a Thursday, but I'm trying to break things up to where we do. I have my scheduled video on Monday. And then do, instead of doing my scheduled video on Wednesday, my second one of the week, I'm going to do the dividend power hour now. And then on Friday, you will get my second published video. So we're going to try and, and um, Shuffle things around here just to see how, how folks um, like you guys like them, how many people are able to join. I know we've done Dividend Power Hours on Saturday. We've done it on Thursday, and now we're doing them here on Wednesday. And again, I am out here in New Orleans. So if any of you are from New Orleans, and you know, so I'm here in downtown. So if you have any great spots to eat, let me know in the comments section. Let me know where you're tuning in from. Um, I know we've been a little bit quick here, just making sure everything's set up. So uh, I see Kevin is, is tuning in. Uh, Christopher is in the house. Remember to like the video. Let's go, the J. Amadou is in the house. Hello. Greetings from Galveston, Texas. I'm actually closer to you than I usually am when I'm at home in California, Eddie. We got Earl 
Welcome to NOLA. Okay, we got someone from New Orleans in the house there. Awesome. Checking in from Minneapolis is Drew. Good day from Matthew. Hello, Sean. Bro, this translates to don't borrow money from James. And Kristen is tuning in from Temecula, closer to my uh, hometown where I'm usually from, but again, in New Orleans for a conference today. So that's why you see the setup here, uh, the lighting a little different the background a little different. So we're going to make it work because we still got stuff to talk about. Is it time to buy stocks? Is it time to sell stocks? Not really always time to sell stocks, but is it time to take a break? Are there opportunities out there? We're going to take a look at all of that today. So let's keep rolling here. So as you know, this is the first full week of earnings season. Q3 earnings season is underway. The banks, big banks, we had Wells Fargo, City, and uh, JP Morgan kick us off last Friday, but this is the first full week, and we're going to take a, um, a look at some of those as well today. Um, in terms of economic news, we got some U.S. retail sales came out. Um, those jumped 0.7% in September, which was higher than the 0.3% we expected. That's kind of a, a big outperformance. And then we're going to take a closer look at housing again. We've reached 8% on the 30-year mortgage rate. That's the highest level in over 20 years. So Definitely something to keep an eye on there as, uh, you know, it makes sense. Higher mortgage rates, lower mortgage demand. So that that sector, I think, has a lot, and we've talked about it in recent weeks, has a lot to come down and retreat a little bit just based on, uh, in my opinion. So let's begin by taking a look at consumers. Consumers are keep, they just keep consuming. It doesn't matter. You know, there's all of these headwinds that folks talk about in the U.S. economy. You, you know, are, is uh, unemployment going to tick higher? Average hourly coming down, higher interest rates, um, U.S. debt over $1 trillion for credit cards alone. There's a ton of headwinds. Is there a recession coming? But consumers keep consuming, and that's what's keeping this economy afloat here. So in September, we saw U.S. retail sales climb 0.7%. In September, analysts, again, were looking for 0.3%. So a, a pretty solid beat there in terms of what actually happened versus what economists were looking for. Um, retail sales account for one third of all consumer spending there. So it's it's an important metric to follow, especially as an investor trying to, to kind of foresee where things are headed. Now, September is a little bit interesting because there's a lot of overlap there. You got some back to school, some end of um, some starting of holiday shopping. So there, there's some components there. I'd like to see this continue. Um, I'm not going to put too much into it. So we'll have to see what the next month's going to be like. Um, but again, the closer you get towards December and even in December, there's a lot of holiday spending that goes into it. But again, the holiday spending period is huge for the stock market, huge for the economy. A lot is baked in on what are we going to do in Q4. Um, auto dealers saw a 1% sales gain during the month of September, which accounts for a good portion, 20% um, of retail sales. So that had a lot to do with the outperformance we saw. Um, in totality there. So now let's transition from retail and let's go over to housing. And again, I always like to, to give a little bit of an update on where housing is because it's such a big um, factor in terms of the overall economy. So the 30-year mortgage, again, topped 8% for the first time in over 20 years. So look at the difference here. A $400,000 loan, you can see the example over to the right, is costing more than $1,000 Per month, if you had a 30-year mortgage and you had to take out a $400,000 loan for the house that you are purchasing, look at the difference between 2021 and 2023. Now, again, that's at a 7.7% 30-year mortgage. I just stated that we're at an 8%. So if I did that with an 8%, you can imagine that this difference is going to be that much more. And this is just roughly two years ago, two, two and a half years ago, however you want to put it. You could see that for a four hundred thousand dollar loan in twenty twenty one, you're going to pay roughly six hundred and four thousand dollars. That's adding in not only the loan you have to pay back, but all of the interest that you have to pay back. Okay, you were paying below a three percent interest rate in twenty twenty one. Now you're at an eight percent interest rate. You're paying over a million dollars for that same exact loan that you were going to take out to buy. That just especially first time home buyers, it's really pricing out a lot of folks right now. And the thing that's really keeping um, this sector afloat, I should say right now, is cash buyers. And the you know those tend to run out because it's a smaller subset. It's a smaller group of folks. There's not a lot of folks that can come in and say, yeah, I want to buy that $500,000 house. Um, here's cash. Okay. I know I can't do that. Um, and the majority of uh, folks out there can't do that there. So if you can, awesome. But uh, I, I would be shocked if there's, you know, 
a big portion of, of those out here right now that can actually actually do that. There's always some. But um, continuing on with housing, we also got October U.S. Home Builder Confidence. A survey goes out to all the national uh, home builders there. And that index rating came back at 40. Expectation was 44. So it came in below expectations by a good number there. Um, this is the third consecutive monthly drop in terms of um, confidence there. And it's the lowest level that home builders have hit since the start of the year. So since January there. Um, in addition, September housing starts. This can kind of be a, a press on where is the housing sector going to go? Because, you know, if we're starting to build houses, it's likely going to have finished houses. And then once you have finished houses, higher inventory, then the housing can sell. But if you see home builders cutting back on permits, cutting back on how much um, housing they're going to actually start building or actually building, that can really show you where is this sector headed. So um, September housing starts came in at 1.36 million units. Expectations were 1.37. Not a big difference there in terms of what actually happened. Um, but building permits, they have to put in building permits before they start building an actual house. Those fell 4.4%. Um, and But that was a little bit better than what economists were thinking. They thought they would fall even more, roughly 6%. So curious, you know, in the audience, for those of you that are watching right now, what have you been seeing in your areas in terms of housing? Have you started seeing more housing breaks? Have you seen more houses go up for sale, less houses go up for sale? I'd be curious to know down in the uh, in the comments section there um, why we kind of keep rolling away here. So what have we gotten in terms of economic data so far? Last week, we went over CPI data. The week um, Also last week, we went over PPI data. Remember, producer, that's the wholesale index. Then we went through the consumer index and saw the differences there, um, explained the differences there and looked at the results. Now we get U.S. retail sales. What else is going to come? We see housing data, housing starts. Tomorrow we get existing home sales. Um, what else do we get this week? We get our weekly jobless claims, which come every Thursday. See if we have any uh, uptick there, unexpected uptick. Uh, what's our unemployment rate going to be at? What is the continuing unemployment rate at? Um, but one of the main things that investors are looking at, focused on tomorrow, is Fed Chair Jerome Powell will actually be speaking tomorrow. So what are we going to get? Is he going to talk more about higher for longer interest rates? Is he going to comment on um, CPI and PPI coming in a little hot and saying it could be likely that we get a rate hike here in the next uh, the next meeting, which is at the start of November? And speaking of that, let's head over and see where does um, uh, where do folks think the next rate hike is going to be? So the next meeting is on November 1st. So if you're looking here, you can see that 80, let's call it 90% roundup are saying we're going to have a pause. There's going to be no rate hike here in this next meeting, uh, November 1st. 11% is still holding out hope that, you know, or, or believe that we will get a rate hike. If we move up to December 13th, though, you can see how things kind of shift. Um, the, the, the camp that believes it's going to stay the same for the rest of the year goes from 90% down to 60%, making it likely that Roughly, we'll call it 40% believe that we will get a rate hike between now and the end of the year. Again, there's only two meetings left for the Federal Reserve. Some of that, though, is being pushed out now to a January meeting where you can see 47, more than 47%, we'll call it 48%, believe that we will have a rate hike between now and the end of January. So that's that, you know, the Fed has talked a lot about we're going to get one more rate hike, likely get one more 25 basis point rate hike. Um, by the end of the year, that could be getting pushed out. You know, a lot of Fed officials have come out and spoke, both both voting members and non-voting members. Um, but a lot of them have been talking about keeping rates really the, the same as where they're at right now. No need to make a rate hike. And that's why we see 90 percent believing that it's not likely that we get a rate hike here in the November meeting. But all, all the bets are off, though, in December and January, where a lot of folks think we will get um, rate hikes there. So let me head over to before I keep rolling here and see what's going on here in the uh, in the comments section. So we got Morton in the house. Morton, good to see you there. Hit that like button. Uh, Teresa, thank you. I appreciate that. Let's see. James, houses sell very fast here in Vegas. So you're seeing uh, are you seeing a lot of inventory or are you just seeing the ones that do come for sale and it's not a ton of them? They just tend to, to not be on the market uh, pretty quick there. So interested to, to hear what you have um, to say, all right, Matthew, builders putting up homes like Mad in West St. Louis area. I see them building a ton in my area too, over in uh, in Orange County, California as well. 
Okay, Earl's got a recommendation for me. Check out Nona's Cajun Cuisine. Is that in downtown? I'm in downtown here. So if it's walkable, I will definitely uh, want to check that out. All right, Kevin, what I have noticed in my community is the huge number of multi-level apartments going up. Interesting there. I was reading something today on, on multifamily housing um, that there's a little bit higher supply than there is for single family, kind of looking at demand and supply. And they had concerns over the multi-level property valuations moving forward. Just something I, I read there. So it'll be interesting to kind of uh, watch that. <clears throat> Peter Hahn, yo, yo, made it. Awesome. Great to have you there. Michael, Commander's Palace. Try them. Then go somewhere and get red beans and rice with some, I don't even know how to say that, sausage. Okay, I'll, I got that on the list now. Christopher, Reno Housing Market is having some fluctuations this year. Victor, I've been doing well. I'm here in New Orleans, living the dream. I finally was able to attend one of your live shows. I'm so excited. Glad to have you. That's why we like to try and mix it up. We get different groups. Once I do on Saturday, I get a ton of uh, Europeans when I do it on Saturday, Saturday mornings because they're like, man, I'm finally awake when you're doing a live show. And the whole idea behind the live show is to interact with you folks, see what you're seeing in the market. Um, what are you investing in? What are your thoughts on the market? And just go over some economic data that I'm seeing. And we can just bounce ideas off of our entire community. We're trying to build an investor community here um, with uh, um, Rusin Financial and here on this Dividend Power Hour as well. So James is going to comment here in Vegas. As soon as they're up, they're for they're as soon as they're for sale, they are sold. So still moving pretty quick there uh, in that Las Vegas area. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for interacting there. So that leads me to another question here, and this one it really isn't um, uh, investing specific here in terms of um, a lot of thought process. So everyone can answer this. All uh, seventy five plus of you that are watching right now, at what age did you start investing? And really the idea behind this is I have a lot of um, mix of new investors, um, moderate investors, and people that have been investing for decades. But those that come in that are brand new, they're just like, oh man, I don't know if I should start. You could see that it's going to be a, a mixed bag. You're going to have people that started in their 20s, maybe even before their 20s. But you're also going to have people that started later in life. You'll, you'll see, I come across people that start investing in their 50s, 60s. They just get to it late. But again, it's, it's never too late to start investing. Now is a better time if you just say, oh, it's just way too late to, to start investing. No, no, no. Because if you're not putting your money to work, then as we have seen, especially the last two years, then inflation is going to eat away at it. So if you're just going to stuff it under a pillow, if you're just going to put it in a savings account that is lacking and it is, is not going to keep up with the likes of inflation, then you're going to have a tough time moving forward. So let me know in the comment section, when did you start investing? So we got Teresa started at 26 Frank at 29, James at 43, waited too long, but it's better now than, than ever, right? Or better now than continuing to wait. 43 is probably, had you done 53 though, you know, you're, you're already 10 years ahead of that. So it's never too late to start. Um, obviously the earlier, better, it's going to make it an easier road. Um, but you guys know what I mean there. So Lovetto 25, Peter 35, Sean 28. Uh, hey, good to see you. I'm 43 and started investing two years ago. Awesome. Congratulations. Christopher, 50. See, better late than ever. Exactly. Wes, 44. You could see the mixed bag, what I'm talking about right now. We're in our early 20s and we even have 50 here and you're probably just enjoying it too. Everyone's going to say, I wish I started early. I wish I started in my teens. I did not. But all right. What do we got here? VT or VWO, VYMI, VIVE. I've been browsing on the pros and cons to have multiple ETFs regarding almost the same portfolio as just one ETF there. So those look like a bunch of, uh, those are all international for the most part. For me, I like to kind of consolidate. So me, you know, if I'm looking at something like VTI, which is a, <clears throat> as you guys can see, I'm still dealing with that cough I've had for over two weeks now. Um, it's an asthma related thing is what I'm finding out. And lo and behold, I'm traveling and forgot my inhaler. But, um, but going back to being too consolidated, you know, too diversified, I should say, is a better word. There's VTI and VOO. For me, I like to have more exposure to the larger, those bigger companies. I'm, I want more exposure to those top, you know, 10 companies than I want some exposure to those bottom 2,000 companies or whatever VTI has. So, it, you know, it's just kind of mixing, mixing and matching. So me, I don't own VTI. I own VOO. Some folks, you know, it's obviously safer to own VTI because, you know, the only way for you to lose all of your money is if every single public company in the entire U.S. 
went under. Very not very likely. It can still, you know, flow, but it's going to be a lot more diversified. So it really depends on do you want more diversification or slightly less? I'm still getting the top 500 companies. That's the reason I go VOO there. James, you're okay. I started at 45, Mamadou. Matthew got an early start in his early 20s. Eddie, 67. Dude, it's tech, 24. Kevin started at 53. The other Kevin, we got back-to-back -back Kevins here, started at 22. Danny started at 47, a little late, but up to 40K. That's the thing is when you get later in life, sure, you could start, you could get a later start than you um, planned or that you would like to have. But hopefully those, those latter years, you're making a lot more than you did in your younger years. So you could help kind of catch up um, a, a little bit there a lot faster. Um, got gifted shares of Delta as a kid. Airlines are a tough one to be in right now. I'm 31. I started at 29. I told myself I need to do something else with my money than just sitting in the bank. Having a son now, I want to be able to leave him something. Monthly dividends, about 100 bucks. That's just awesome, Jay, there. That's, you know, the whole press predecessor. When, when I'm talking to potential clients that want to come in and work with me one-on-one, -on -one, I do a six-week Invest Accelerated course. I tell them, I'm not trying to just put a plan for you to, to make some money and to build wealth. I'm trying to put a plan together for you that builds what I like to call generational wealth. I want you to be able to leave something lasting behind, whoever that may be. It could be a spouse. It could be um, kids. It could be uh, nephews. It could be uh, whoever it may be. I'm looking to help you build generational wealth. That's the whole goal behind the six-week investing accelerator course, teaching you how to invest and build out a customized program um, for folks. So that kind of just, you know, leads into that course. I open up enrollment when periods come open. So it comes, you know, every um, it could be a month and a half. It could be two months until I open up the next one as we're coming up to the holidays. So right now we, we reopened it up. I only do seven of these each time we open enrollment. We are down to ha having two final spots for folks that want to work with me one on one. We had a ton of signups last week. I know um, I think we opened up our calendar for next week. If you want to make a free evaluation to come in and say and see, is this investing accelerated course for me, you can set up a 15 minute call. The link is down in the description below. Um, but again, this isn't a, a free workshop. This is for folks that want to come in and they want to invest in their knowledge. We put together a customized um, action plan and just see what type of investor you are and teach you how to value stocks. Look at all the different metrics that I utilize. Look at how to um, look at stock charts. And for those of folks that are a little bit more sophisticated, we even touch on option selling, how you can use options to generate more income leveraging your own portfolio or leveraging positions that you may want to get into just at a lower price. So definitely, if you want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, I only do seven of them. We got two spots open until we close enrollment again, and we don't know when we're going to open them up back up and at what price point. So definitely check that out down below. So now let's transition over into earning season. Again, as I mentioned at the forefront, this is the beginning of the first full week of the Q3 earning season. And it's just going to, um, the, the levels are going to ratchet up even higher as we get the big tech companies coming out next week, the Apples of the world, uh, Microsoft's of the world. We got Tesla and Netflix today, which I have a slide for those, even though they're not dividend stocks, we're still going to kind of go through them um, here today. So let's begin with Charles Schwab, uh, stock ticker SCHW. They reported adjusted EPS of 77 cents, which was a beat. They beat by three cents per share. Their revenue came at $4.61 billion, which was in line with analyst expectations. So not a huge um, beat there. Um, but, you know, the outflows were really starting to moderate. We had that mini banking financial crisis early in Q1 of 2023 in March. We had uh, a couple bankruptcies go into play, um, the whole SVB debacle and all of that stuff. Um, SCH, SCHW really had a strong sell-off. Um, there, was, there was liquidity concerns, but we've seen all of that moderate. They're very different than your traditional bank. They're an investment management firm. And we've seen the outflows moderate and the company making some solid um, earnings and being able to have more earnings power with the amount of cash that they've been able to keep now. They're not seeing loads of cash leave the door anymore. So that was a very positive sign in terms of SCHW. The other, um, a tr more traditional bank, a big bank. We saw Bank of America on Tuesday report EPS of 90 cents. That beat by eight cents there. On a per share basis, revenues also beat. So top and bottom line beat there for Bank of America, $25.2 billion in revenues. Um, that was a beat by $130 million there. NII, though, has been moderating. The thing with banks is they have what's called net interest margin or net interest income. And that's really going to be the difference of the, the interest that they can earn from products like 
Um, loans, if they give out a loan, they obviously earn interest from loaning those dollars. But then they also have to turn around and pay interest for things like CDs, uh, savings accounts, and whatnot. And when you offset those, that'll give you your net interest income. Well, for the much of the past year, we've seen that the, the rates that they're able to charge was really outpaced how fast they were upping high yield savings accounts or CD rates and whatnot. So there was some big time growth in net interest income. And what folks always said when it comes to banks is the fact that um, we need to see uh, rates go higher in order for them to make more money. Well, now rates have been elevated for a while. And now the whole thing surrounding banks is rates are too high due to the fact that a lot of the CDs, savings accounts, all that stuff has kind of caught up and it's really moderated the growth within net interest income. But as rates fall, again, you better believe it that you're going to see your savings account rates, the variable ones, fall a lot faster than the rates that the banks are offering on loans to, to be able to create some, some income there. So just a little um, blurb on, on banking and, and whatnot there. So another company that already reported earnings this week was Johnson & Johnson, one of my favorites, a core holding of mine. Um, J&J, this was actually their first uh, quarterly earnings report since the full spinoff of Kenview, full, um, you know, since they've sold a, a big portion, they had 90% or so of Kenview. That is now down to under 10% ownership of Kenview. So they sold off uh, um, the majority stake that they had in them. They reported adjusted EPS of $2.66 per share. EPS came in at $2.52. Um, that, that was what estimates were. So it was a big beat there on the bottom line. Revenues came in at $31.35 billion, a $300 million beat on the top line. So overall, um, top and bottom line beat for Johnson Johnson was uh, a solid quarter there. Um, we're seeing solid growth from um, uh, their medicines and um, slower, but you know, hopefully moderating and, and that'll pick up for their med tech sales. So that's really, you know, Johnson Johnson for years had their consumer health segment. That was the Tylenol, Band-Aid, Listerine, all of that stuff. That is now Kenview. They had their pharmaceutical, which is now their medicine, internal medicine um, segment. And then they had their medical devices, also known as MedTech now. So they, they're just left with the two main segments there uh, for J&J. &J. So another one that, that reported was actually a REIT, one of my favorite REITs, Prologis, stock ticker PLD. They released uh, earnings this week. They came in with FFO. Again, we don't look at EPS when it comes to REITs. We look at funds from operation or adjusted funds from operation. That came in at $1.30. Analysts were looking for $1.25. So a beat there on the bottom line. Revenues came in at $1.92 uh, billion, which was a beat by $180 million. And they increased their Q4 guidance. So very solid in terms of quarter, but the stock did um, did sell off there. They still had uh, a solid occupancy rate at 97.1%. So again, this is a great long-term play and it's a play if you're looking for exposure to the growth in e-commerce. E-commerce is expected to penetrate retail sales about 1% through 2026. You're getting, so right now it's closer to, you know, uh, 15 to 18%. Well, it's going to grow 1% of total retail sales every year. And when you have more and more e-commerce, you need more and more warehouse space for the most part. Think of Amazon, which is the largest tenant for the likes of Prologia. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of a backdoor way to play the growth in e-commerce without having to actually make sales. These are more long-term investments with, with uh, Prologis there. So interesting there. These are kind of four main ones that I've um, been covering this week alone. But now let's get to a couple non-dividend stocks. So um, if you are just a dividend investor, just stick with me here for a, a few moments. But these are some major stocks that can sway the S&P 500. Uh, Netflix after hours is just blowing it out. Let, let's take a look and see where Netflix is uh, trading at after hours. When I was originally preparing this, uh, this slide deck here, the stock was, yeah, it's still, look at that. You're getting 12% after hours. Now, again, that's just after hours. It doesn't, it kind of tells you which way it's likely going. Will we get 12% tomorrow? Will we get 6%? Either way, it seems like it's going to be a solid day for if you own right now shares of Netflix. They just, they blew it out of the water. It was a great overall quarter there. Um, even the best analyst expectations, they blew out of the water there. So let's take a look at those first here. So on the right side of your screen, you can see adjusted EPS of $3.73 per share. EPS estimates were looking for a $3.50, so a big time beat on the bottom line. Revenues came in at $8.54 billion, which was actually in line. And 
that doesn't make a ton of sense to me. So we're going to look more at the reports because the fact is, if you go down one spot there, you can see that they added 8.76 million new subs on a net basis, new subs during that quarter alone. And if you recall, uh, even if you own Netflix and may, you may have been uh, sharing a password for years, really, they've really cracked down on that. It started really in, in Q2 and it's um, it really went for a full quarter here in Q3. So, you know, that's definitely paying off there. You're seeing the folks that can no longer share say, do I want it or do I, I've had it for so long. Um, I can't be without it. Let me sign up for that. And again, they have their ad supported one, which is cheaper and they have their full premium one, which is more expensive. Um, Netflix actually likes for folks to sign up for the ad one, the cheaper one, because their margins are a lot higher there. So, but when you add 8.7 and you blow out EPS numbers, but your revenue numbers come in line, that just seems a little bit weird there. So I, I'm curious to know, you know, of these 8.76 million subs that were added, was the majority of them on the back end to where maybe the, the revenues, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with the, uh, how they're, how the, how are the, there's that big of a disconnect between being in line with revenues and then blowing out by 20 some percent down on the bottom line there. So something to, to look at if you're a Netflix shareholder there. <clears throat> so let's move over to Tesla and let's, you know, browse over and see what is Tesla doing after hours. So Netflix with a big beat. Tesla, on the other hand, is down 5%. So they had they were down pretty much 5% uh, today alone in the open market. And it looks like tomorrow is going to be a big beat as well. As you know, if you're a, a Tesla shareholder, the company has been continuing um, these price cuts. They're trying to make that, especially that uh, Model 3, a lot more um, open, bringing in a, a larger group of folks that can actually buy a new car and actually buy a Tesla. So um, at least that's what they've been saying. That's been the messaging coming from Elon and team. So, um, but the, the nature of the beast is that this continues to impact margins and margins are falling fast. Now they don't compare to regular, like auto um, airlines and autos tend to trade at a very low margin. And when you have companies that trade at very low margins, there's very little risk uh, for air. If you have a bad quarter, you don't have much room for, for air there. So Tesla has always, you know, they're direct to consumer. They've been able to operate at very high margins. Even if you look right here, operating margins in the prior year, this same quarter a year ago, were at 17.2%. Today's operating margins down to 7.6%. That's falling um, over to, uh, roughly 200 basis points from just one quarter ago, 9.6. So those are, those are trending down, not only trending downwards, but they're trending downwards at an extremely, extremely fast pace. Um, adjusted EPS came in at 66 cents per share. Uh, analysts were looking for 73 cents. So we had a miss there. Uh, revenues came in at 23.35 billion. That missed by nearly $800 million. So miss on the top line, miss on the bottom line. Um, operating margins going the wrong way. They produced 430,000 vehicles, delivered 435. <coughs> they still think they're going to meet their goal of uh, in, in Q4 there. So there's a lot going on in Tesla. It's an extremely tends to trade at a premium there um, for investors. So uh, do you own Tesla or Netflix? And are you looking to continue um, to own those uh, moving forward? Let me know in the comments section real fast. All right, let's keep uh, rolling forward here. My next question, this is my last question of the day aside from Tesla and uh, Netflix. Let's move over to Apple. Now, Apple hasn't reported earnings, but there's a lot of Apple fans out there. And, and Apple has a, a big portion of, you know, uh, not just the S&P 500, but a lot of retail investors portfolios out there. Hedge fund manager, doesn't matter. Apple is the most widely owned stock out there. So looking at today's valuation, if you had no stocks and you were looking to put a hundred bucks to work, are you a buyer or a seller of Apple. I'll give you a second. Let me know down in the comment section below. Are you a buyer or seller of Apple? And with that, I'm going to take a chance over here to jump into the comments to see if I've missed anything. <clears throat> How much percent of your check should I use to weekly... Um, should I use weekly to invest? That really comes down to your age. There's a slide that I go through 
Um, it's usually around 10 to 15 percent, but that's usually if you're someone that's starting in your mid 20s. If you're starting your savings towards retirement and say you're 35, that's going to go up closer to 18 or so, 18 to 20 percent. And as you get older, if you're just starting, it's what it, it's really predicated on what age you're starting and how consistent you've been doing it is it needs to be a higher percentage there. So um, without knowing that information, I, I can't uh, answer that. Uh, in the French Quarter. OK, that's in relation to Earl's comment up above. Started at Mike started at 67. Earl started at 45. And Dewey and Dewey is how you pronounce the sausage. OK, I was going like armadillo or something like that. I had no idea how to to say that. And Dewey sausage. Eddie, even though I started at 67, I did have money saved up in the bank as well as sold my decorative concrete business. And right now I'm close to $308 a month in dividends, which will double next year. Awesome. I love that doubling part there. Earl started during the pandemic, made some mistakes, learned from them, hopefully, and then just kept investing. There's no perfect investors out there. Uh, as we've seen, Warren Buffett has made plenty of errors. He got into technology way too late. Um, he, he messed around with with airlines, which is a, a that's not a business that I'm ever looking to invest in long term. Can you trade airlines? You certainly can. Very cyclical. I mean, they're the definition of cyclical investments. So there's there's no need to to um, look back and 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 worry about the the losses that you've had. All of us are going to make losses. It's just learning from those losses. Why did I lose money here? Was there something that kind of happened? And some of it you may not you can't even foresee. So with those, you just kind of got to move on from it. The J is, is pushing. I love it. Thank you, sir. Earl, S-C-H-D, V-Y-M, D-G-R-O, D -G -R -O, all in. Oh, we got another one here. Port of Cow, best burger place in Nolens from Long Island, New York. What else we got here? Big swings tomorrow when Jerome Powell speaks. It usually is, so you got to be prepared for that. Tesla's having a hard time with interest rates. <coughs> they certainly are. Interest rates are, are weighing on, on their sector. Um, but the other thing that was unique is the fact that how much, you know, for, for years, and one of the reasons they've had such good margins at Tesla is due to the fact that they haven't really had to market. Their marketing is referrals. And now they're actually pushing to where they're adding a marketing line. They have a marketing budget moving forward to try and, and generate more demand there. So that is something else that's going to, Hopefully help top line, but it's something that can definitely weigh on uh, operating income again. So definitely something there. Clinical research from large sponsors has been slowing down with huge layoffs from what I've seen. I wonder how this will affect earnings. Yeah. They had some news on cyber trucks. There is a ton of cyber truck um, deposits out there and they're expected Q4 to be the, the rollout period for cyber trucks. So you might start seeing some some tri cyber trucks on the road here uh, in the next few months. But again, just because there's a lot of um, deposits or, or, or whatever it may be, that doesn't mean it's going to turn into an actual sale. There's a lot of people that wanted to just put their name on the list. But when it comes down to it and saying, hey, uh, Joe Schmo, you're next on the list. You need to put down, you need to buy the truck now. We're going to start building it. They could back out um, from that standpoint there. So, um, you know, take it, take it for, with a grain of salt. Fabio, how's it going? Uh, Peter's going to add to Tesla when it dips a little more. You're getting a 10% dip the last two, day, two days. Cybertruck in November, possibly sticking with Tesla no matter what. They so have an AI play too, so definitely interesting there. So Christopher, let's see. Are we, are we buyers or sellers of Apple? Christopher's a buyer. Not Slip is a buyer. Uh, Alejandro has been buying lately, but fractions. Kevin's just holding. Holding Apple. Seller. There's our first seller. Free stock promotions is selling. Christopher Dukes is a buyer. The other Kevin's a watcher. Not slip. I'm holding, but if I have to buy or sell, I'd buy. <coughs> I wonder how that's going to change here, folks. We're going to look at some slides that might be a little interesting to you buyers here. Peter's buying. Thank you, Eddie. I'm trying to figure out, you know, I've been on two different meds to, to try and fix this. And 
it's going on uh, three weeks now. So I appreciate that. Make sure you get a gas station shrimp po' boy. They have, have some po' boys here at the uh, at the hotel. Can we please get some likes on the video? Let's go. Buying an ETS, Matthew. Okay, so we got our buyer. It seems like most of you are buyers when it comes to Apple. So let's take a closer look at Apple. And the reason I wanted to do these slides is kind of show you um, just a little bit insight into kind of what we cover and the metrics I go through when analyzing a particular stock. And if this is something that interests you, then you're definitely going to want to sign up for the six-week investing accelerator course to learn exactly how to do this. So let's begin with the Apple chart. So as you can see here, uh, all the different colored lines, you know, the green lines going horizontally, um, the red lines com coming down diagonally, those are all drawn by me. I use um, TradingView. It's, a, it's, a great, it's free there if you just use you know, different indicators. But looking at Apple, you can see the fact that Apple is trending lower. It's on a down, uh, downward trend line here. So we're trending downwards. Um, you can see where is the, the next area of support when it comes to Apple. So let's make things a little easier here. And let's just go to the Trading View website so that we can all see it interactively. So here's our Apple trend line. You can see things are trending down when it comes to Apple. It, it kind of hits support on the bottom and it meets resistance at the top. And it's just continuing to do that. You could see this dark blue line. That's actually the 200-day moving average. That's usually a very strong area of support for most stocks that are out there. Not ones that are hugely volatile, but a company like Apple it tends to be a strong support line. Not a lot of companies will fall necessarily below their 200-day moving average all that much. So right now, the 200-day is sitting you know, right around $172-ish right now. So that's going to be the first area of support if I were looking at, at Apple. Right now, we're trading closer to $176. So we're continuing. But as you can see here, we bounced off the top of this lower. So we're making lower highs. And lower lows here. So we bounce off at above 182. And likely, if we keep this same trend line and we blow through our 200 day moving average, this trend line is saying we could end up in somewhere in the mid 160s, high 160s when it comes to Apple. Not a ton going, it's, it's a terrible looking chart right now. If we go up here, this indicator at the top of your screen, this is called the RSI. So this is a technical um, momentum indicator. So anytime we're in the, the shaded area, that's a little that's thought of as normal. A period between 70 and 30. Anything above 70, which you could see up here, usually indicates that the stock is overbought, meaning that the, the, the trend can reverse downwards in the near term. Anything at or below 30, near 30, below 30, usually indicates that a stock has fallen too much and it is what's called oversold. And you can look back on, on history here. If we look back at the last time it went under 30, it went to 26 here on August 17th. Let's look down the trend line. That was the lowest point that Apple had hit since dating back to early or mid-May. Again, a low indicator there showing if you would have bought it when we had an RSI in the 30, you could have went from low 170s up to $190. That's if you're trading around technicals. So now let's go back. And let's go back to the, so chart wise, not something that's great to look at. Now let's take a look at valuation. Now valuation, I'm first and foremost, a fundamental investor, meaning that I'm not trading just solely on technicals. I'm never making a decision based only on technicals. First and foremost, I want to see fundamentals. Fundamentals tell me more about the business. What are the operations? What's the operating margin? What's the free cash flow margin? How is the company doing at uh, efficiently creating you know, revenues are great. If you have, you know, a hundred million dollars in revenues, that is fantastic. But if our margins are so, say, you know, 2% for every um, hundred million we sell in, in revenues at the bottom line, we only have 2% left over. That doesn't tell me it's a very efficient company. If we have a hundred million dollars in sales and we have a 50% margin, that's, there's a lot more efficiency going on there. High margin dollars, which allow us to not only invest back into the business, increase the dividend, make strategic acquisitions all focused around growing. But if you have that company that only has 2% margins, whether it's a free cash flow margin, whether it's an operating margin, there's not very much you know, room for error. So it's great that our, our revenues are going up, but if we're only able to generate um, $2 for every $100 that we have additional in revenue, 
not something that's uh, that that's great for moving forward in terms of growth. So let's look at a- Apple's valuation on a price to earnings metric trailing. Right now, Apple trades at 29 and a half times. Their five-year average is closer to 22.3 times. Now, Apple has has changed a lot over the past, you know, especially the past decade. So, so maybe we could say, hey, let's look at over the past three years. That puts it closer at around 25 times. Still, PE ratio is well above that uh, three or five. 2024 EPS growth. This is based on average analyst estimates. They believe that next year's EPS is going to be $6.54 per share. That is below 10% EPS growth moving forward. Not a ton of growth. And usually when you invest in companies that have a lot more growth for it, that usually coincides with a higher multiple. In this case, we're looking at a stock that has a higher multiple, but very little growth backed behind it. So on a forward PE multiple, we're looking at closer to 27 times, still above their three-year average, and well above their five-year average. Let's look at now the peg ratio. And the way that what you want to look at when it comes to the peg ratio, the PE ratio is the most popular metric that's out there. A lot of folks just stop there. Um, you shouldn't ever stop there. There's a lot more you need to look at when evaluating a stock. What the peg ratio helps you do is say, okay, that's great. I'm paying 50 times for NVIDIA, but I'm also getting 50% growth. I'm paying nine times uh, price to earnings m- multiple, nine times for something like Altria Group, but you get 8% growth, like very little growth. The peg ratio helps me put together the PE ratio combined with the estimated next 12 months growth rate. So although I'm paying a high price to earnings multiple, if I'm getting a good amount of growth with it, the next 12 months, then the peg ratio is telling me it's worth it. And what you're looking for with a peg ratio is you really want a peg ratio to be below one. So if you have a company that trades at a price to earnings multiple of 50 times and you're getting EPS growth of 50%, that's a one to one right there because you turn the 50% into a full number. That's a 1.0 peg ratio. That is very solid. Now, if you're trading uh, on a stock that's 50 times, but you're getting 10% growth, well, then that's a, uh, a five times peg ratio. The PE that you're paying doesn't really match the growth that you're getting. It's way too expensive. So Right now, on a looking at a peg ratio, Apple is closer to 3.0, three on the dot. So you're paying a lot in a premium multiple for very little growth, below 10%. Something to keep an eye on there and, and to consider when you're looking at Apple. Um, you know, peg ratios are much lower for the likes of Microsoft. Uh, think of something like Starbucks. You know, you're paying a much lower premium, but you're getting more growth. Starbucks is expected to get growth of over 20%. Next, uh, next 12 months. And they have a PE ratio much lower than the likes of Apple there. Okay, great. So we looked at PE ratio. We've looked at forward PE ratio. We've looked at peg ratio. None of them are lining up so far. Let's keep going. Um, how about EV to EBITDA? Enterprise value to EBITDA. EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization there. They normally trade at 18.2 times. Right now they trade at 21.7 times. This isn't just average numbers that I'm looking at like across the industry. This is average numbers based on Apple alone, just Apple that we're looking at here. So if you want to have an argument saying, hey, they're a much different company now than they were um, five years ago, that's fine. Look at something like a three-year average, but you're still going to see that they're well above those. Um, Too many folks want to put Apple in a category of a, a, a services company that has high margin. Services are still a small piece of the overall pie. Let's not make Apple into a complete service company when their bread and butter is still a consumer electronics type company. They sell iPhones, iPads, MacBooks, Macs, so on and so forth, Apple Watches. That's their bread and butter. The services is growing, their fastest growing segment. But let's, you know, just it's still a small piece of the pie there when it comes to uh, comes to Apple. So let's look at free cash flow. You know, this is what I always say it. Free cash flow is what makes the dividend grow. Dividends are paid from free cash flow. Acquisitions are paid from free cash flow. Um, Uh, Share buybacks are paid from free cash flow. This company is a strong free cash flow company, which is fantastic. But on a price to free cash flow basis compared to their five-year average, they are well above their five-year average there. Want to take it to the three-year average? They're still well above there. So that's five or six metrics that we just looked at right there. And not even one of them is pointing to a buy. And this is one reason I've talked about it on this dividend power hour before to be mindful of, you know, there's a lot of folks that love Apple out there, 
but what is your reasoning behind it? Just because it's Apple, the valuation, and no matter what stock you invest in, the valuation always has to make sense. So number one, does this make sense to you? Number two, does this change your thoughts on whether, you know, if you were a buyer before, are you still a buyer now that you understand more about valuation? So that'd be interesting there. What, what do you guys got there? The Jay says, can we please get some likes on the video? Let's go. Uh, interesting and safe dividend aristocrats. When the market drops 50%, share prices drop, yet the dividend still gets paid in increases. Are bonds still useful in that case? Well, share prices can fall. And again, a dividend yield is has an inverse relationship to a stock price. So as a stock price comes down, a dividend yield goes up. As a stock price goes up, a dividend yield comes down. Um, but if you saw a stock price drop 50%, that there's there's something underlying uh, physically wrong with the company. You know, they maybe it was a pharmaceutical company that had a big time um, uh, phase three trial that a lot of investors were were baking into their um, projections moving forward that just got nixed and said, oh no, we're not moving forward. That that would bring it down. The stock price would fall. There's a lot of free cash flow. If the company can't generate the free cash flow because there's something underlying physically wrong with the, the fundamentals of the business, well, then, although that dividend looks great right now, that dividend can certainly get cut. We see it you know, all the time. Look at AT&T as a good example. Um, you know, medical, uh, WP Carry, medical properties, whatever, whatever the list goes on, especially during the pandemic. If the company can't back the, the fundamentals, it can't generate the free cash flow to pay the dividend, they have to cut the dividend. The yield might be high for a moment in time until the next quarter when they make the decision, but it's just, you know, don't, don't get suckered into what I like to call those sucker yields up there. We're selling apples and buying oranges. Jay's dripping. Shots of whiskey with honey will get rid of that cough. Trust me, I've tried that. Uh, do you trade any small caps? I don't have any small caps myself right now. Michael's a buyer of Apple. Peter said, I guess I'm holding and waiting to add now. Apple has an ecosystem that's still growing and that's the growth in revenue. And it's nothing, you know, there's always a disconnect. You know, you don't want to, it can be a great company, but doesn't necessarily make it a great investment at this point in time. Apple is a fantastic company. Don't get me wrong there at all, but it doesn't mean the valuation is great either. If it pulls back or so and gets down to the, you know, 160 range or so, then the valuations look a lot more intriguing. Still a great company, but the valuation's a lot more intriguing. You're paying a big premium for growth that's less than 10%. 10% growth is something like Johnson & Johnson. That's that's very, you know, you don't pay um, 27 times, 29 times for Johnson & Johnson. You trade something like 15 to 17 for the likes of Johnson & Johnson. Andre, what's up, Mark? Sorry for being late to the party. No worries at all. All righty. Well, hopefully that makes sense there on, on Apple. Um, voice is starting to go, so we're going <coughs> to wrap it up here. So here's our, our normal year-to-date sector performance that you can see. Um, we're getting a, a few more, more green sectors coming on there, so that's been, that's been nice. Hopefully we get that, that Q4 rally. I definitely think there's a lot of um, near-term pressures, but I'm still a believer in the, in the fourth quarter rally, you know, based on retail sales and stuff that we're continuing to see, unemployment staying low. Um, not a big spike in, in the jobless claims. Um, folks are still spending money. We'll see how average hourly earnings continue to go. But um, if, if things kind of stay status quo, I don't see any reason why stocks don't go higher to, to close, the, uh, close out the year. And again, that's just my, my opinion alone. And here's a look back at the, uh, the, uh, how sectors have performed, the 11 sectors of the S&P 500, how they've performed over the past 30 days. Um, we only have two sectors in the green. Infotech is, is holding on to a slight... Uh, a slight green there um, with communication services. So we're really close to actually having all 11 sectors in the red. Um, the big laggards are utilities, consumer discretionary, and retail there. So um, that kind of wraps up our, our dividend power hour. Again, if you're interested in working with me one-on-one, we got two spots left before our uh, enrollment period will be closing. Um, there's six sessions. So we do a six-week um, course. We do once per week. There's 60 minute sessions. You'll be working with me and only me. We don't pass you on like other courses to any other uh, teachers that are out there. And all, every single one is going to be different. How you invest is going to be different from another person. That's why we kind of build these out 
on a customized approach. I have some folks that come in that want to focus more on growth stocks. I have folks that I work with that are strictly high yield passive income. I have more folks that are middle of the road. So depending on where you're at, that'll kind of show the direction that we're going to take this course. So the link's down in the description below if you're interested in working with me uh, one-on-one there. Um, but also, look at my newsletter. I send out a free newsletter every single Monday. It's just kind of a recap on what the market did the past week. What are the five big stories that are in the market? What are some things to look forward to? Um, analyst upgrades and downgrades and, and all of that type of information. And then I have a premium subscription. If you are a premium subscriber to the um, my Dividend Investors Edge, then you will see that earlier today, I saw my earnings recap. We covered in-depth SCHW. Bank of America. We also did Johnson & Johnson. I'm currently doing write-ups um, all throughout this week here. Earnings season is very busy, so you get those cool infographs and stuff like that. So definitely check those out. Hit the like button on those ones as well. Um, but if you're not a premium subscriber, then definitely check that as well. It's pretty much a dollar a day. You can get my monthly portfolio. You see my entire portfolio. You'll get, my, you'll get monthly updates. You'll get um, earnings deep dives. So we go through stuff that's in our coverage area, mostly dividend stocks for the most part, not all, but mostly dividend stocks. And then we do deep dives on two individual stocks uh, every month. So definitely come check it out. You can check it out just for one month if you want to as well. So any final questions before I log off um, for our dividend power hour today as my voice is about uh, to go there. So um, thank you guys for tuning in here. Again, I'm here in New Orleans at a, at a conference. So um, you know, if you are watching and you are part of the, the FinCon conference and hello, come say, come say hi while I'm uh, throughout the lobby. Um, and with that being said, thank you guys so much for, for tuning in each and every week. It's always great seeing familiar faces and it's always great seeing new faces. We're all just here trying to do the same thing, build our wealth primarily through dividend stocks. So thanks again for tuning in. You'll see a new video from me coming out on Friday. So again, videos on Monday, Friday, we're going to start doing our dividend power hour on Wednesdays. We'll mix it up doing Saturdays every once in a while so we can bring in that European crowd as well. So thanks again for tuning in, guys, and we'll see you next week. Take care.